Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Carbon Webinar number three. Uh, my name is Irene Suarez Martinez. I am a researcher at Curtin University in Perth. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, to whatever time on your side of the world it is. Um, just a reminder that this seminar is going to be recorded and it will be uploaded in YouTube uh, probably tomorrow or the day after. Um, so please stay muted while we are having the, the seminar. Uh, but uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Feel free to type them in the chat box, uh, which is on the bottom, and you can see where it is in on the screen. Um, so feel free to type them during the talk or at the end of the talk. Um, it's just your call. If you prefer to speak, um, you can raise your hand on the reactions, which is um, two, three buttons from, from the chat box. Um, and I think that's all we need to know about this. Um, we will post a link about Gather Town um, for um, those who want to have a little bit of a social interaction after that, after the seminar and the questions. But now I would like to introduce um, Professor Rooney Ruoff, who um, has agreed to give this seminar. Um, many of you probably know uh, Professor Ruoff. Um, he's internationally known for his work on uh, carbon nanoscience. And if you work in the area, you have had read quite a few of his papers. It's pretty difficult to avoid. <laughs> he's prolific and he's um, very uh, doing cutting edge science. He is a chemist by training. Uh, he worked in Germany and the US, but in 2013, he moved to South Korea, where he is a distinguished professor uh, of, at the Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology. And he's the director of the Center for Multidimensional Carbon Materials. He has worked a lot on uh, mechanical properties of a variety of uh, carbon materials from Fullerens, um, graphene lithography, nanotubes. Some of us um, remember the pulling of um, inside walls, inside nanotubes. Um, so looking forward to see what's next that he's going to present today. So after you, Ronnie. Okay. Thank you very much, Irene. I'll just share my screen here. Yes, please. Perfect. Okay. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to participate in the CARBON webinar. Thank you for inviting me and uh, to all the folks around the world. Welcome to uh, hopefully an interesting presentation. And uh, in today's talk, I'm just going to show you a brief outline here. I'd like to briefly introduce UNIST and the Institute for Basic Science because we're both 10 years old, fairly recent entities, and uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing in the group. Uh, and then I'm going to follow the scheme that you're seeing on your screen and uh, probably get down to the bottom here in 45 minutes, but we'll see how things progress. So here's UNIST. Uh, this is Ulsan, South Korea. We're about right there where my cursor is. And we're the fourth IST in Korea. So you've probably heard of KAIST in Daejeon, and there's also DGIST in Daegu, and JIST in Gwangju, and now there's UNIST in Ulsan. So we focus on science and engineering research primarily. Okay. And uh, this is an overview of our campus. And the Institute for Basic Science has been in existence for 10 years. And you can let your eyes scan through the different centers that are listed here. So we're classified by these different topics. And Institute for Basic Science is modeled something like the Max Planck Institute, sort of Korean version and the goal is to embed long-term basic science very deep in the Korean culture. So I'd like to start with uh, metal, liquid metal uh, composites that we made. 
and tell you a little bit about this work. So working with, for example, gallium, which is a fascinating material and its eutectics, uh, such as with indium and with tin and the gallium indium tin eutectic. We have done some recent work uh, mixing in carbon filler. And I'm going to briefly tell you about some of that work. So what we did is we sort of serendipitously discovered that uh, graphene oxide and graphite oxide can be wet by gallium. And that was a bit puzzling at first because we know that gallium doesn't wet graphite or diamond. And so the when we were playing around on a different project and saw graphene oxide flakes being apparently wet, that sort of uh, aroused our interest. And I challenged Chunhui Wang, who's shown in the picture here on the left, to try to make putty-like materials, try to mix in the graphene oxide. And eventually we could do that, not only with graphene oxide, but with reduced graphene oxide, with diamond particles and silicon carbide particles. And ultimately we end up uh, understanding also why the mixing would work even with graphite particles or diamond particles, which nominally are typically not wet by gallium and mercury and the eutectics. So we started with graphene oxide and at first we were mixing just by hand in a mortar and pestle and then eventually this went toward mechanical stirring and using ball millers and so on. Shouldn't we, uh, began to explore these other sorts of mixing options. And this is showing this putty-like material that results. Now, an interesting thing, as I showed you some little figurines before, but also this putty-like material can be actually cast into any shape. So it's worth noting that uh, although gallium's melting point is very close to room temperature, it typically can be uh, supercooled or is it sort of an unusual material in that it supercools well. So it, it remains sort of solid like at room temperature. And after the putty like materials are cast into different shapes, we found that they don't actually undergo volume expansion upon solidification. Gallium is like water in terms of its phase diagram. It actually expands when it freezes. So you can see that with pure gallium in the lower right here. Another interesting thing about our putty-like materials is many of you are probably aware, but gallium is a, a material that uh, amalgamates with many other metals. And so it's very sticky and uh, its oxide skin is also very sticky, gallium 2O3 but the putty-like materials don't leave any residue on these different materials that you see here, such as glass, copper, steel, and tungsten. So one of the reasons why uh, the mixing occurs is because a, a thin skin of gallium oxide forms. In fact, uh, once we formed that hypothesis, we checked whether we could form these putty-like materials inside a glove box, and it wasn't possible to. And that was sort of mixing by hand and then also using the mechanical stirs. And so uh, we could disperse graphene oxide inside, as you see in these cross-section images. Now, Chunhui invented, I think, a very clever technique to make the reduced graphene oxide mix with the gallium. If he took reduced graphene oxide powder and he attempted to directly mix that with gallium, it didn't work. Uh, we think these days we could actually get that to work, but uh, when we were doing this and for what we published on, that didn't work. So what he did instead is he took the gallium putty with the graphene oxide embedded in it and heated. And so as many of you might be aware, uh, if there are multi-layer stacks of graphene oxide, they have interlamellar water between the layers. 
And for the individual layers, they are chemically functionalized with hydroxyl and epoxide groups, maybe a small amount of carboxylic groups as well. And so when we heat, uh, we can evolve CO and CO2 and water and generate RGO, but it's actually embedded inside of this uh, brittle material that is highly porous. But if we, again, mix this with a ball miller or by hand, we then end up with the liquid gallium returning uh, because when you handle it by, by hand, it warms up a little bit. And then we could make uh, very nice putties with reduced graphene oxide through this, this sort of approach of heating it first to convert to the RGO, but have it intimately mixed with the gallium. So you see these additional uh, pictures are showing what happens during this sort of heating, the way it will enlarge the structure. So one of the things we did was we explored EMI shielding and we coated our gallium putty with RGO, for example, uh, on A4 paper. We coated it on a thin film of stacked and overlapped RGO platelets and RGO film. And without going into details, uh, I can say that the EMI shielding efficiency is very effective. Then another thing we did is we thought about thermal conductivity and possibilities for using this for heat management. So one of the things we learned in our study is that uh, there's a certain size threshold beyond which the filler could be mixed in. And if we were below, uh, roughly speaking, that size threshold, then they wouldn't mix. And so for the larger diamond particles, we got pretty nice uh, composites forming. And you can see here uh, between the diamond and the gallium, a very thin layer of gallium oxide was evident from our elemental mapping in cross-section with STEM EDX, for example. So uh, you'll want to read the article for more detail, but without any doubt, the reason why the mixing occurs is because when we're doing the mixing, the uh, skin-like layer of gallium oxide, which is only one to two nanometers thick, is constantly being formed and enshrouding the filler material. And that's why it didn't work inside a glove box. So indeed, when we took our gallium putty with RGO sheets or with diamond sheets, we got a very significant increase in thermal conductivity and diffusivity. And then with our colleagues at UNIST who are expert in making measurements of thermal interface materials, we could see that these performed extremely well as TIMS as thermal interface materials. And so I'd like to uh, thank also our colleagues at UNIST who are expert in, for example, thermal conductivity measurements and also the thermal interface measurements. Generally speaking, I think this, this will readily expand to higher temperature than room temperature liquid metals. For example, I can see that there may be opportunities with tin and bismuth and some of the other metals and working with those where composites might be useful, but not necessarily needing them to be liquid-like or putty-like near room temperature, maybe at a few hundred degrees Celsius. Okay, now I'd like to switch very briefly just to mention that we have begun to work on zeolite templated carbon. And many of you will be aware that uh, the uh, field has been pioneered by Professor Kiyotani with, with colleagues. And uh, the idea of using zeolites as a template to uh, successfully deposit carbon and perhaps have it have very uh, unusual three-dimensional configurations is something quite fascinating and uh, 
we decided to get into this and we'll try to hopefully make some new contributions to the field, but certainly inspired by the work that has been done by others. For example, also my colleagues here in Korea uh, at KAIST, led by Professor Ryu, and they found that adding uh, by ion exchange, lanthanum, for example, to phalgocyte, uh, zeolite, uh, could effectively catalyze the introduction of carbon into the pores in the zeolite. Then there's this interesting paper that appeared from Berent Schmidt and his co-authors. David Prosperio was joining in on that work as well published in PNAS in which they looked at a number of zeolites, I think about 50 actually, and showed that many of these, uh, of course can in principle template highly idealized structures that experimentalists would like to match. And they uh, pointed out that three of them actually are equivalent to short sites that have the so-called negative curvature carbon named after a mathematician who didn't know anything I think about carbon but knew a lot about mathematics. So uh, here's our vertical CVD system. We happen to be focusing on phalgocyte, zeolite, and you, we are exploring different time temperature profiles for forming our zeolite templated carbon. So this is what we have in terms of TEM before CVD and then after CVD, but before we've etched away the zeolite. And then finally the zeolite templated carbon after we removed the template. You can see in SEM images that it would be hard to distinguish the zeolite alone from the carbon. Uh, one expects to have a certain loading ratio if uh, the network is more or less completely forming, not that it's perfect. And that should be around 0 0.35 grams of carbon per gram of phalgocyte, for example. So one thing that we're bringing, I think, which is new, is that we're collaborating uh, with Professor Fei Wei and colleagues at Tsinghua. And they have this new capability, IDPC STEM. And so, for example, we're uh, studying the zeolite templated uh, material with the zeolite present, and we can uh, find particles that happen to be oriented so that we can look down the channels with the stem. And this differential uh, phase contrast mode is very, very powerful for actually observing varying amounts of filling in the channels. So this is something that we think could be powerful for looking at these sorts of materials, including as a function of batch studies in which we've partially filled the channels all the way to perhaps complete filling. Okay, now I'd like to move on to talking about uh, graphene and also F-diamine. And finally, toward the ends of the talk about our recent work, which will be appearing sometime in the next month or so on, you know, essentially nearly perfect single crystal graphene, but that's, you know, a, an interesting topic to discuss, of course. So let me briefly go through metal foils, including uh, discussing some recent breakthroughs by other research groups. So uh, typical metal foils are polycrystalline and you're looking at electron backscatter diffraction here in which we see the different grains that are present uh, by the different coloring. So these highly polycrystalline foils in the last few years can be converted to single crystal, even at large length scale. So I'll show some of the work from our own group in which uh, we hang, for example, copper foils, we heat to a little bit below their melting temperature to about 1070, copper melts at 1,085 degrees Celsius. And then in argon, but particularly with hydrogen present, we anneal for about 12 hours. And we do see uh, still grains present near where we hung the foils, but in the free regions, it actually can 
undergo, undergo what we refer to as colossal grain growth, where the entire region here becomes a single crystal. So these are EBSD images acquired at different points uh, along this foil. And you see that the out of plane, but also the in plane orientation shows that we have single crystal everywhere. So if you grow, uh, for example, graphene on this copper 111, first nucleation occurs and then the islands are clearly epitaxial and also aligned with each other. So this is also seen when we grow a, a full film, we have low energy electron diffraction showing, showing a single crystal. <clears throat> so we've done this also with nickel and cobalt, other close packed metals. And finally, also with platinum and palladium. Now, when we published, we did this with joule heating. Uh, we now have a, a furnace that goes up to 1,700 degrees C and that we can also add hydrogen to that allows us to hang foils in it. But uh, for this to work well, it has been necessary to be fairly close to the melting temperature. And so at the time we didn't have a furnace, so we used uh, resistive heating, I squared R. And you can see this region here is essentially single crystal platinum. And then this is where it was attached to water cooled electrodes where it's still polycrystalline. It was actually uh, fortuitous or serendipitous that uh, Sung Wan Jin accidentally left hydrogen turned off. So we had begun to really believe in the importance of hydrogen based on copper nickel and cobalt, but he got a very good conversion even with the hydrogen uh, not on. And then when we explored a little more of the literature, we found that vacancies are not really assisted in their formation in platinum. Platinum has a very low energy barrier for vacancy formation. But in the other metals, hydrogen plays a special role, sort of like lubricating formation of vacancies. And it's the formation of vacancies that uh, are perceived to allow grain boundaries to move. And so uh, it was insightful for us to realize, ah, that might be the role of the hydrogen. Uh, in fact, the activation uh, energy or the barrier for vacancy formation in the other metals besides platinum and palladium, copper, nickel, and cobalt, is fairly large. And so the hydrogen is very, very useful in that it lowers that energy barrier. So then we have work out of Peking University, Kai Hui Lu's group. So not just 111, but now we have really a wide range of HKL choices that can be present as large uh, foils. And in their work, this was done by a seeding method uh, I won't have time to go into great detail, but it gives us so many more options now to have large area single crystals that are really quite inexpensive to produce. And uh, there's a recent paper out of National University of Singapore, Kate B. Lowe's group. What they did was they made cuts on the edge of a polycrystalline foil. And then they found when they heated, they couldn't a priori know which AK, HKL they would get, but they could get, you know, you can see here, multi-centimeter single crystals again. So it's a very simple method of generating these, uh, a, a certain variety of single crystal orientations. So I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about copper nickel and where that led us to, but in the back of my mind, uh, when we were doing all of this that you see here, uh, well, particularly these two papers, primary research, uh, we were very interested in ultimately having high quality AB bilayer that could lead to making diamine. So I'll come to that a little bit later. So once we had our copper 111 foils, I had the idea that we can electroplate nickel and we'll try to heat treat and see if we continue to have a single crystal. There were reasons to expect that we would because copper and nickel are neighbors in the periodic table. They have almost exactly the same size. 
and they're actually completely missable from zero to 100%. And it turned out fortunately that when Ming, our student in material science, uh, undertook this project, everything worked really, really well. So when Ming electroplates uh, a copper 111 foil with nickel using electroplate electroplating bath, he's measuring the current. And if we integrate the current, every time a nickel two plus cation arrives at the cathode and is reduced with two electrons, we count those two electrons. And so from the integrated current and also weighing the foils before and after, we come to the conclusion that we can control the nickel concentration in these alloy foils to three significant figures and possibly three and a half. So that turns out to be very valuable. The, the ability to finely tune the nickel concentration in the copper turns out to be very, very useful. So after the electroplating, uh, Ming would typically anneal for about 12 hours, also around 1070 degrees C, and then we'd end up uh, with a single crystal copper nickel foil. Now, my group had some history uh, in this, uh, in terms of commercial copper nickel alloy foils. So some of you might've heard of these, the, they go by names like 7030, 8020, 9010. The first is the copper, the second is the nickel atomic uh, concentration. And they're used in maritime and anti corrosion applications in seawater. But the thing is, even though they're, they're quite handy, and they led to some interesting studies for us, uh, it was, you know, very important to us to be able to use these, they have other elements which are deliberately added for that anti-corrosion capability. So they're really not pure copper and nickel. They attracted our attention because uh, the binary phase diagram of copper and carbon and nickel and carbon are quite different in that the solubility of carbon near the melting point of copper is a few parts per million, but the solubility in nickel also at a thousand degrees C so uh, at, at the same temperature as copper is actually one atomic percent. So if you have an alloy, one would expect perhaps there's a possibility of forming bilayer or trilayer, whereas the copper typically favors formation of only monolayer, as we have this sort of highly limiting reaction on the surface, but very little dissolution of the carbon down into the copper that might come back by precipitation, for example. So our first effort was to grow monolayer graphene by controlling the nickel concentration at a lower value. And this is just to show you that the nickel plays a, indeed a different role than the copper and the growth rate can be very, very fast. Uh, these sorts of Raman spectra that you're seeing are now standard in graphene research. So spectra and also mapping in a map, each pixel is a certain uh, designated quantity. So you have obtained in that uh, region a full spectrum, but you can plot, for example, ratio of intensities of D to G peak or 2D peak full width half maximum, et cetera. These maps are showing that the graphene is very, very high quality. You might wonder what the dark spots are. Those are cosmic rays. So we have really no control over those. Those uh, will bleach uh, one of the pixels in the detector. One fascinating thing about this study was we found that irrespective of whether we had 1.3 atomic percent nickel up to about 9.5 atomic percent nickel, in all of those compositions on the surface, we had C6 nickel one, C6, excuse me, copper six nickel one composition. And uh, this was uh, discovered by Hunsup Lim, who at the time was working with us. And he's now actually at GIST. Uh, and uh, Hunsup was able to analyze these 
low energy uh, electron diffraction patterns, but particularly low energy. So as we studied this, we realized this is really a superstructure. So we dialed down the kinetic energy of the incident electrons and Hinsup was able to discern that this superstructure at the surface with uh, stoichiometry copper six, nickel one, is uh, only one or two atoms thick. It's not three atoms thick, but we couldn't discriminate if it's one or two atoms thick on the surface. So it's kind of fascinating. And I think these foils, when we make alloys from them, are going to have a lot of these sorts of surface compositions that will differ than the bulk. And that will be interesting also for growing things on them. We then move to ramping up the nickel concentration. So in a parametric study, Ming could find conditions with the nickel concentration up around 16 to 20% atomic percent where almost all of the film formed was bilayer. And um, essentially all of that was AB stacked. So uh, another very nice paper here. If he changed the composition closer to 20 away from 16%, then we also could get about 60% ABA trilayer graphene. And so these maps again are showing very high quality. Now I'd like to move into talking about diamine and uh, what is diamine? Well, first we have a little home built reaction system here. So I'm going to tell you about fluorinated diamine. So Pavel Bakarov uh, led this study and was working closely with Manoff. Manoff moved to a new faculty position in India and Pavel continued the project. And we had close collaboration with Professor Sankyu Kwok and his students, Sung Oh and Sehun and Professor Zhang Hun Li in terms of beautiful TEM done by Suk Wu, which I'll be showing you some images of. In this little home-built system, we have xenon difluoride, and if you mildly heat it, you get certain vapor pressure into your reaction chamber. And this is where we would put our uh, AB stacked bilayer graphene, either transferred onto a gold or copper, excuse me, gold or nickel uh, TEM grid, which are resistant to fluorine, attacked by fluorine, copper wouldn't work. And then sometimes we actually left them on the copper nickel substrate and we would uh, achieve fluorination of the AB bilayer. The fluorine would seep underneath and, uh, and react. And also some of it would go into the copper nickel substrate. So for stoichiometry C2F, uh, which would be expected for the diamine stoichiometry, and if it was hydrogenated, it would be C2H. We might expect this structure shown on the left, but there could be the possibility of the structure on the right, for example. It turns out that this is in fact what we made. Let me point to Leonid Chernozatansky and colleagues. They published the first, art, first article about diamine. It's a combination of the words diamond and alkane. And so uh, their paper was about uh, C2H. And I think it was a really fascinating paper. As soon as I saw it, I was immediately interested in trying to make this material. And uh, actually before I formally started at uh, UNIST in January of 2014, we were already working with Professor No Jung Park and his postdoc Dorge and student Dung Bin on modeling uh, multi-layer graphene, excuse me, uh, that was epitaxial with copper or cobalt or nickel surfaces. And fascinatingly, even with copper, we actually found evidence in the DFT calculations of carbon copper bonding forming at the interface. So in this simulation, we had the interface forming uh, a bonding, which was actually a little more stable than the free bonding to either H or F. And this paper also discusses the 
dependence on the number of layers. And so uh, when we had published this, my younger boy at the time was, so it was eight years ago, he was four or five years old. So he said, daddy, why don't we just take graphite and put this stuff on the top and bottom and make a big piece of diamond. I thought that was pretty clever. And I, I needed to explain, just doesn't quite work that way, unfortunately. Once we get to about 10 layers in our calculation, the enthalpy of formation became uh, unfavorable. So let me go straight to some pictures uh, because seeing is believing. And these beautiful cross-sectional images are showing the copper nickel substrate with the AB bilayer graphene in the left here. This material deposited on the top allows doing the cross-section by a uh, focused ion beam in a scanning electron microscope system. Then after we fluorinate, we find, or I should say Sukwu finds uh, distances for the CF bond of from 1.49 to about 1.62. And uh, the average value actually was, was typically about 1.62 over long counts. And the average value of the buckled planes that I showed you before, uh, the CC value here, uh, between those buckled planes is 2.06 angstroms. That's actually identical to diamond and this 1.62 angstrom value is identical to the CF bond distance in CF4, for example. So uh, these really were very compelling images to us and Sukwu also obtained other data on films that Pavel prepared. So there's a lot of science behind this, of course, many parametric studies by Pavel of different reaction conditions and a lot of XPS data that I'll have to cover very briefly tonight, but it was really uh, XPS that primarily was the guiding light for Pavel in terms of knowing when he had C2F stoichiometry to hand off the best possible samples for for TEM, for example. So you can see the, the filtered images and simulated images are almost in perfect agreement. And the simulated and the actual experimental selected area electron diffraction are in perfect agreement as well. Now we also have uh, eels taken in TEM and then modeled by uh, our colleagues in Feng Ding's group. And uh, the DFT modeled eels is in pretty good agreement with the experimental eels that was obtained. Now here's a fun one. Uh, the image shown here, I need to tell you about it. This little region here is single layer graphene. We know that from Raman. The rest of this here is all AB bilayer graphene. But in this part right here, another layer grew on the copper nickel and we ended up with ABA trilayer. So due to work by others in the field, you know, these are, uh, spectra clearly tell us whether we have ABA or AB misoriented third layer or ABC, for example. Now it turns out to make trilayer diamine, it's expected that you need ABC. If you have ABA, the third layer is actually in the wrong position for carbon-carbon interlayer bonding to form. It would not be expected. And in fact, after we fluorinated these with, at that point we knew the best way to do the fluorination to get diamine to form. We had evidence of diamine forming here, but uh, in this region here, it didn't form as one would have expected uh, because it's ABA. So it's, it, it can't drive reaction that will form the interlayer bonds. So I'll need to be brief, as I mentioned, about talking about the beautiful uh, series of XPS studies that Pavel did actually over a period of, I think roughly about a year and a half. So we chose fluorine uh, rather than hydrogen because it turns out with hydrogen, you cannot distinguish in the C1S region of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy from the CC bond. So CH would not be distinguishable from CC. 
And also hydrogen doesn't have any XPS spectrum, whereas fluorine has F1S and carbon has C1S. And the CF bond is in a clearly different position uh, for example, as shown by the green here, then the CC interlayer bonds if they're forming. We also did XPS at uh, tilt, and these tilt studies turned out to be very, very important for understanding if interlayer bonding was forming or not. So I'll have to go through these a little quickly to be able to finish the talk. But we have F1S uh, spectra shown here, and through this sort of analysis, you see these different parameters ratioed with respect to each other. We uh, can see, uh, we can tell that, you know, for example, among these three different reaction conditions, it's sample A that the C1S and F1S spectra are telling us through this analysis that we have stoichiometry C2F. And it was these samples that you saw the TEM images of. Okay, and this is simply showing uh, uh, some more XPS data, but let me here concentrate on photoemission data and UV-Vis photospectroscopy. And in UV-Vis data, we can see that the band gap is about 3.3 electron volts. Now, we didn't experimentally determine whether it's a direct or indirect band gap, but calculations by sang Quax group show uh, that it should be a direct band gap. So diamond has a band gap up around six electron volts. The F diamine has a band gap of about 3.3. Bilayer graphene doesn't have a, a band gap. There's an interesting paper from Zhang Fan Lu and colleagues at Peking University theory uh, paper. They talked about strain engineering. But I want to point out that even at zero strain, they calculate fairly high hole and electron mobilities for this F diamine. And another very interesting thing that we observed when, when Sukwu was doing the TM imaging, if he dialed up the electron beam uh, flux uh, to a certain threshold value, it would defluorinate the F diamine and that region would pop back into AB bilayer graphene. And so I think there is very interesting possibilities in the future as we get better and better large area bilayer AB stacked uh, bilayer graphene to, to make large area F diamine and then to write, for example, with an E beam, maybe with UV light as well, and actually create conducting paths and in between them have these semiconducting regions that might have very, very high carrier mobilities, just as one example of possibilities. I actually uh, am more excited, but that's just my bias and preference about potentially uh, making diamond by a new method. So if so, uh, some clever chemist in the audience uh, or some clever chemist who read our work can figure out a way to activate the CF bond and replace it with a carbon atom and then build upwards. I do think that it won't be too long before we have wafer scale or bigger, you know, single crystal F diamine because of how the graphene field is advancing. And so that could be a very nice substrate for building diamond upward that would be very large area, single crystal diamond, if everything went really well to stay within about 45 minutes. Briefly, we're also working on large grain size graphite. I just wanted to mention, we haven't published that yet. Uh, and this was a very interesting study that we've now submitted. Uh, Mengran Wang uh, was studying liquid molten salt electrochemistry. And we found when we undertook electrochemistry with carbonate, lithium carbonate salts, for example, we got a very interesting growth of nanowalls on the copper 111 foil, as they're shown here. They actually are influenced by the crystal structure of the surface. So that's a, an interesting story as we have not seen 
uh, organized growth of nanowalls in the literature, but there's been a lot of beautiful studies by others of their growth by CVD. And uh, we have an interesting sort of pleating or folding in these nanowalls as well. Okay, that's a sort of a, a snapshot of some of the uh, work underway in the group. And this was when we didn't have to wear masks, so back in 2019. So thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ronnie. That was, uh, that was a mindful of new materials and, <laughs> and techniques, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, um, if you got anyone who has any questions, you can either type it in the chat and um, we can uh, go through them and Ronnie can answer them. This it was fascinating <laughs> stuff. I, um, Jake, can you? I, I, yeah, I see a question from Sung Jin. Oh, oh, we have them. Uh, Would you like me to read it out, Irene? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Hello, Ra. This is Sungjin Park. It's been a long time. Thank you for the interesting talk. You're welcome, Sungjin. Nice to hear from you. About F. Diamond or F. Diamane, to use uh, Professor Chena Zatansky's uh, terminology, you talked about a band gap about 3.3 electron volts. Do you think it's a band gap of the crystalline materials? Might be from mid state energy levels, which are originated from defects associated with F atoms? A very good question. And uh, we, with Professor Kwok, modeled the band gap of perfect F diamine. And it was, a, I don't remember the exact number now, uh, Sungjin, but it was a little different. And so we uh, rationalized, in fact, that it might be due to the presence of some defects that the value is 3.3. So that deserves further exploration. And uh, the perfection of the F diamine for the TEM images, you know, looks very, very impressive, but TEM is a kind of a snapshot of a small region. And so I think it deserves further study. Uh, and, you know, the types of defects that might be present might be playing a role. The Dong Chen Chi uh, says, it appears fluorine termination of bilayer graphene is not essential for the conversion to diamine as compared with, for example, H termination? Um, it's a good question. Uh, we happen to think it will be harder to make H diamine. We've proven we can make the F diamine. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, it already had been generated. Uh, it already had been uh, discussed in the literature, excuse me, uh, the C1F1 fluorinated graphene and uh, in terms of fluorination, it's possible to reach that stoichiometry. Also, I studied by XBS, and this was Jeremy Robinson at the Naval Research Laboratory and colleagues, and also the team at Manchester independently. But there's no evidence that uh, graphene, when we say that, meaning stoichiometry C1H1 has been made. So I think it's under hydrogenated, the types of materials that have been made. So it deserves further study. And there's an interesting possibility of perhaps fluorinating on one side and hydrogenating on the others and things like that. So I, I don't know whether the H diamine will, will ever be made, but I certainly hope that it will be. And, uh, and so it's an open question at this time. But our choice of fluorine was by Pavel was indeed guided by the expectation that XPS would be very valuable and we, you know, the XPS was very valuable for C1F1. So, and, uh, and that, that guided our thinking that the F diamine might be a more likely candidate to pursue. Uh, Chris Manage uh, Kaur uh, was wondering if the metal foils would have enhanced electrochemical activities at edge sites or basal planes. Yes, we, we think so, Manoj. Uh, uh, that paper is just submitted, so uh, I'll leave it at a more general answer if you don't mind. Uh, we, yes, we think the steps and the basal planes can have different electrochemical activities. 
which could be very valuable to, to synthesis. And Chris uh, Ewell's uh, uh, about the fluorinated bilayer, I think it's be possible to substitute fluorine under some circumstances, laser desorption in the presence of hydrogen, yes. I think these sorts of things are worth pursuing. We're not currently working on it, but I, I would hope that others would consider doing things like that. I think those are good things to try. Start with the F-diamine and try to get that to assist us to make H-diamine or make a Janus type material where we have different functionalization on each side, different dipole moment, for example, on the bonds. It could be very, very interesting, those sorts of structures as well. Oh, here's one from Nigel. Oh, Nigel has one. Is there anything, anything special about fluorine? Will fluorine be diamine be possible? Fluorinated diamine has been discussed by theoreticians and it, it looks, Nigel, like the chlorine is too large to achieve the C2 CL uh, stoichiometry. So per calculations looks unlikely, but doesn't mean people shouldn't pursue it. In the same sense, the, the monolayer graphene, the stoichiometry is, is not really yet approaching C1, CL1. It's usually pretty a preponderant carbon. Uh, and here's Dong Chen. How yeah. large is the lateral size for the F-diamine produced usually? Uh, we got up Dong Chen to sort of millimeter sizes. So in, it's a really good question because I'll just as a little humor, uh, I remember talking with my colleague No Jung Park about our work with DFT calculations and no Jung is a, a physicist who has a lot of other things on his mind, like superconductivity and so on. And I ask him, No Jung, why does the diamine form in these calculations? And he said, Rod, we just run the DFT program, it forms. <laughs> so he, he, he uh, would have uh, uh, that point of view as a, as a physicist with a small unit cell, which is periodic, and the system is perfect. But how about computational material science where one worries about, well, what about nucleation barriers? And it's got to start somewhere in a real world situation. It doesn't happen simultaneously over a large area. So I don't really know uh, how large a lateral area can be made, but I'm hopeful that at least for bilayer, that it can be over a very large area and that we're really limited now by having very large area, perfect uh, AB stack bilayer to try experiments on. So I, I, I scour the literature and my colleagues and see what they have achieved. There was a very interesting paper out of Parochia Go's group at Kyushu University recently and so on about perhaps larger area AB bilayer. So that I think is the sticking point. We have the larger area, at least bilayer, and we can show that the F-diamine can be made over very large areas, then, you know, then one can wonder about three layers and so on. So I don't have an answer beyond sort of millimeter range at this time. Still pretty good. I think it's a, yeah. a great place uh, to stop. I mean, we're gonna get to the okay. end. Huh. And I think then um, everyone who wants to discuss more then we can do it uh, um, in the next bit. So um, I would first of all like to thank very much Rodney because that was a, an amazing talk um, and a lot of new things to discuss and uh, to try a very inspiring talk. Um, the next talk will be on um, uh, simulating carbon. So it will be a theory talk and very interesting by Miguel Caro and we will be looking at using machine learning to develop interatomic potentials. That will be on the 14th of July at different times, depending where you are in the world. Um, but I would like everyone who wants to <coughs> ask everything that Rodney has talked about and any other um, things, um, they will be in the chat box. It will appear now the link to Gather Town. 
So some of you may have already used Gather Town. I think um, the conference NT was using it. So this is a um, software you will, if you click on it, you will be asked to create an avatar. If um, you can just, if you don't want to choose one, just get the default one, just type your um, real name so that people can know who you are. That would be quite useful. And uh, then you move around your avatar with the arrows um, in, the, in your keyboard and you could talk to other people. You will see their names on top and you can just go to them and talk. Um, so you would, and they would, you will have a camera. So then you will see their faces when you are close enough. Um, and yeah, I hope that way this could substitute a little bit what we will be doing in the coffee time after you know, run this talk if we were in a, in a conference face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, we're testing this, so we have uh, 25 people can join only at a time, but if it works well and everyone likes it, we, um, we will um, upgrade the limits uh, and get so that everyone can come in. Um, and yeah, thank you once again to everyone who, who joined us today and thank you to Rodney. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.